Shall we start? Look, I, I thought that uh, I would try to provide some kind of overview of the uh, proverbial 2,500 years of history. Because uh, one of the things that Lynn is always saying is that you, uh, you're not really uh, capable of understanding what goes on around you from day to day unless you have a historical overview that, that contains, at the minimum, uh, six or seven hundred years, that is, say, back to the, to the Council of Florence in 1439, uh, or better, a longer historical overview reaching back two millennia, two and a half millennia. So this is what I wanted to try to do. And of course, the problem with that is how do you fight yourself, how do you fight your way through that forest of, of detail, right? I, I have my watch here. Of course, uh, usually when giving these briefings, I'm reminded that there's a calendar on the wall behind me, even if my watch has stopped. But you see, that's, that's the problem, and how to make sense out of all of this stuff so that you get, a, you get an idea of what actually happened in history. Now, what I think we can do is not to try to describe everything that happened in history, but at least to give the outlines of one side of it, that is to say, the oligarchical side, the side of organized evil. Uh, when we talk about oligarchism, everybody's aware we're talking about this notion of, of, of an irrational principle of domination, some kind of feudal aristocracy that says we are destined to rule, we are a higher species of humanity than others, and therefore they have to obey. You're talking about usury. You're talking about monetarism. You're talking about the rule of families and or fondi and or various kinds of priesthoods. And we'll see uh, examples of all of that as we go along. Uh, this principle. Now, I, I wanted to start by formulating a paradox, which I think really is a paradox. It really is, if you think about it, an astounding fact, although I guess we have become inured to it. If you look at these documents from the United Nations bureaucracy, especially this, this United Nations Development Agency, or whatever they call themselves, the UNDH, whatever it is, development, and when they go through their apparatus of world government and their world court with the subpoena powers and their international financial apparatus and their international economic warfare bureau and all of these other things, if you compare that to the decrees and edicts of the Roman Emperor Diocletian about 300 AD, you will find that the spirit not, even, not only the spirit, but actually quite a number of the details behind these things are exactly the same. And how can it therefore be that supposedly in the culminating moment of the 20th century, the end of the second millennium, right after 2,000 years of Christianity, supposedly, that the main organisms of world public opinion, as they would say, the United Nations and everything that goes with it, is able to come up with a monstrous plan so similar to that of Diocletian, uh, and if implemented, something that would indeed bring on what Diocletian did, a new dark age, which in the, in the case of Diocletian, remember, lasted 500 years, a long night of uh, the, the collapse of the worst collapse of civilization that we've, we've seen in the West so far, or at least in, in this period of two and a half millennia. So there's the paradox. How can that be? How is it that the UN would elaborate a, a worldview that would turn out to be so, uh, so similar, so congruent, really, with that of, uh, of Diocletian? Now, one of the things I hope we can do this evening is, since we've talked about Diocletian, I don't know if people know a whole lot about Diocletian, but this I would like to talk about, because I think this is actually very, very interesting. Now, my answer, the answer that I would like to propose for the paradox is this question of, metastasis. Uh, we, can't, we can't follow this analogy too, too far, but you can certainly say that oligarchism and usually geopolitics, monetarism, so forth, everything that goes with it, Aristotelian philosophy, empiricism, oligarchism is the cancer of humanity. And how does it behave? Well, it behaves in the way that cancers do, in the sense that it moves its location. It shifts its locus and its center of gravity. And that's this question of metastasis. And what I would like to propose is that we look at the, uh, the historical period we're trying to fathom here, the 2,500 years, 
As far as the oligarchical side is concerned, and again, I can't give the history of the other side within this framework because it, it leads in, in different directions, although the, the, the points of conflict are clear enough. The basic idea that I would like to illustrate is the idea of a triple metastasis, for want of a better word. Metastasis that takes place three times uh, in very schematic terms, and it brings this principle of, of Diocletian from the Rome and Byzantine period all the way up through Venice, British Empire, and the United Nations. So we get, first of all, the oligarchical forms that, that were known in the ancient world, in particular these Babylonian magi, the cult of Apollo at Delphi, we can talk about this, the Roman Empire itself, and the continuation of the Roman Empire, this sort of thousand-year rotting corpse of the Byzantine Empire, right, which was so interesting for people like Gibbon. Main idea is all of that, in terms of outlook, in terms of uh, families, fondi, but above all, again, it's, it's the philosophy that counts, then found its way into Venice through things that we've, through processes that we've, we've tried to study, that was then shifted into the British Empire over a period of centuries, and over, in particular, the last hundred years or so, this oligarchical principle has come to make its home more and more in these organisms of self-government, of world government, I'm sorry, world government, one world rule, and so forth. Now, if you look at this in the, in the broadest possible terms, you will see that this does give you a way of making sense out of these long periods. But again, it's got to be done in the broadest possible terms. Uh, for example, when you're looking at the metastasis of the center of world oligarchism from Venice to the British Empire, you've got to include in that things like the Protestant Reformation, the Aristotelian Counter-Reformation. You've got to include the wars of religion, in particular the Thirty Years' War, the creation of the Venetian party in the Netherlands, in Scotland, in England, uh, and so on. And we can look at this maybe in, in some of the coming sessions. I don't think we're going to get quite that far uh, tonight. When we look also at the metastasis from Venice to the British Empire, we have to remember that this reaches all the way, really, just about to the end of the 1700s, to the end of the 18th century. And that's where you get these characters, Casanova, Cagliostro, and of course, the inimitable Gian Maria Ortez, but also this Antonio Conti that we have to talk about, the, the great Newtonian uh, anti-Leibniz operative of this particular uh, salon, right, the Conversazione in, the, uh, in Venice in the, in the 1700s. Now look, we have this cancer metaphor. It's a good one. On the other hand, it, it probably doesn't exhaust all the ways that you want to think about this kind of metastasis, because when you're looking at this stuff, it, for example, means that uh, the, the predominant center of imperialism and oligarchism surely passed from Venice to the British Empire sometime in the 1700s. You could say it happened in 1763, or it happened at some other date, right? some other point in the course of the century. Indubitably, it did happen. Indubitably, uh, the main fondi were transferred from the Procuratie in Venice to the Bank of England through various flight capital channels, the Great Bank of Amsterdam, and so forth. And ultimately, the main center of this stuff did get to be in the British Isles. But that doesn't mean that the earlier center is simply shut down. That would really be a, a tremendous mistake. And even the British had the fleet and they had the geopolitics. And even into our own century, the espionage, intrigue, and epistemological warfare coming out of Venice is really as important and very often more important than what's coming out of the British Isles themselves. And, and certainly that's the, I think you can, you'll see that when we get to people like Casanova, Cagliostro, Conti, and, uh, and Ortez, that without the contribution of the Venetians, in this area of, of secret intelligence operations where they really were supreme. They were really much more accomplished than the relatively primitive uh, British uh, beginners here of the secret intelligence service, right? the, the copycats of, of uh, you know, Shelburne and so forth. 
that without, without Venice still being an operative center in the 1700s, the British never could have defeated France and never could have set up their, their worldwide empire. So, again, metastasis as a cancer metaphor is a good one, but it, it somehow it, we shouldn't try to follow it too, uh, too closely because you're, you're talking about a, a growth that moves, but the, the previous center keeps going. And, of course, you also have these other tricky ones here where, as, for example, in Venice vis-a-vis -vis the Byzantine Empire, at a certain point, Venice turns around and conquers the Byzantine Empire, which makes it all rather, uh, rather complicated. In other words, it's not simple. Well, let's try tonight to, to build up to an understanding of uh, Diocletian and his so-called reforms, and why these were bad, and why you don't want to try them again. You don't want to go down that road another time. Uh, and, and where all of this stuff uh, came from, and I suppose where we ought to start is the, um, the cult of Apollo at Delphi, as the, the um, you could call it an, an organ of world government. As a matter of fact, the more you look into it, the more it does appear as, as functioning in many ways uh, similar to the United Nations Security Council and the, and the General Assembly of our own time. <laughs> yeah, you do. Uh, and some of these personalities also seem to come back. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get after uh, Boutros Boutros a little bit later on. Uh, the, the Delphic Apollo, there were uh, probably half a dozen different oracles that the Greek world knew. But this was the dominant one. Uh, and it had this funny position of being in the center of the Greek world in terms of geographical location. Actually, if, if there's, a, if there's a, a map, is there a map around here? Is there? Would it be possible to, like, to get a map of the Mediterranean world or something like that? Thank you. Uh, the legend is that Zeus wanted to find... Sure, sure. The legend is that Zeus wanted to find the center of the world, so he released an eagle from each extremity of the universe. And these flew on a line and met, and that was Delphi. So it's this rocky, craggy place where this strange temple is located. Now, the Apollo that is worshipped there is, of course, the oligarchical deity par excellence. And, and many things flow together into the, into the shape of Apollo. In, in many ways, Apollo is Marduk. Marduk being this uh, sinister oligarchical god of the interior of Asia Minor, of Turkey. But then, of course, there's also in Apollo this overtone of Isis and Osiris, and that Apollo with this pythoness, right, this woman, the Pythia, we'll see who she is, uh, reminds you somewhat of Isis and Osiris and, uh, of course, the fact that uh, Osiris was castrated, big, important aspect in the whole thing, and then brought back from the dead by Isis. This, th the way that the, uh, the temple was set up was that you had this priestess, uh, the Pythia, the Pythoness, who was... Uh, whether she was young, as she was at certain points by, by tradition, or, or sometimes only older women were allowed to do this function, she would uh, start off by being a, a relatively illiterate country woman who knew really very little of what she was doing. But she would mount a seat which was placed on a tripod over a kind of cleft in the ground. It was some, something you obviously you wouldn't want to fall into. But she would sit on this thing. And after having eaten certain kinds of ceremonial foods, burned barley corns and other kind of stuff, she would begin to babble. And she would just babble. And she would go into transports of Apollonian ecstasy, whatever, and just talk, right? Speaking in tongues, I guess, if you've, uh, if you've heard any of that stuff going on. Now, how did anybody make sense out of this? Well, there was a priesthood that was attached to the temple of Apollo. And these were the oligarchical families of Delphi, which was a small state. It was a, well, it was a 
city-state, I guess, to some extent. But small, not populous, not powerful, not anything special in itself. But somehow these people represented a cross-section of Greek oligarchical opinion, and more important, were connected to these Babylonian magi and the people who were operative in the Persian Empire to the east. So uh, the way it would work then is that you would come as a representative of Athens or of Corinth or whatever you were. You would bring gifts, put down money, and you were then allowed to question the Pythoness, who would then go into one of these transports, and she'd rattle off a whole bunch of babbling. And then the priests would come up, and they would explain what it was that she had said, which had, of course, to come out in Greek hexameters of a certain literary quality. Now, that, well, that makes these guys the original spin doctors. <laughs> They put the spin. There was, something happened, and they tell you what it was, right? What did all that mean? And in Greek hexameters. Now, uh, the prestige of this oracle was was uh, immense. It was a uh, it was obviously a bank. There were these deposits of treasure, gifts that were made. This, the, the, the wealth of this place was was a legend in antiquity. And uh, it was also, therefore, a, a treasury. It looks like various cities actually kept part of their funds there as a kind of a central bank for the Greek uh, states. Obviously, with the priests, with cults. And then, of course, the fact that since everybody came there on these missions, the priests learned the knack of pumping everybody for information. So as, as many authors say, this was the biggest intelligence bureau uh, in the world. They would uh, sometimes formulate answers. For example, with one guy, he, he said, look, should I invade my neighboring country? And the answer was, if you carry out the invasion, you will destroy a great kingdom. Of course, it turned out that it was his own kingdom that was destroyed. This was King Croesus. But there are, uh, I think, important uh, tendencies in the, in the way that the uh, Delphic Oracle operated that uh, that are, that are worth pointing out. The main thing is that it was, it was an organ of the oligarchy and that this can be proven by the political choices that it made. I mean, it made these things repeatedly. First of all, the main favoritism of the Delphic Oracle was for Sparta. And why is this important? Well, as Schiller uh, pointed out in that famous lecture on, on history, uh, the principal tendencies that combat in Western civilization are the tendency of Lycurgus of Sparta, the oligarchical, imperialist, militaristic one, and Solon of Athens, the city builder on the other side. Well, it is uh, a legendary that Lycurgus's constitution of Sparta was either dictated, as I think is likely, dictated by the priests of Apollo at Delphi, or at least approved by them. That was Lycurgus brought it to the oracle and saying, don't you think that the Lacedaemonians ought to be governed by these laws? And then, of course, the Pythonists went, blah, blah, blah. and the priest said, yes, you win, Lycurgus. So that is the version that we find in Xenophon, that uh, Lycurgus went to the oracle and got the uh, version, the constitution for Sparta approved. Thank you, Joey. We're just, we're just going through some stuff on the Delphic uh, oracle. Great, over there, yeah, over there would be fine. But not on, not on the, yeah, good. Thank you. Now, um, you can also see in cases of war, the Delphic Oracle would sometimes declare that it was supporting one side or the other. Uh, for example, in the case of the Peloponnesian War, a little bit before 400, right, this general war of, of the Greek states, uh, the Delphic Apollo made a, an unsolicited declaration that they were supporting, they were supporting Sparta. Not only were they supporting Sparta, but they were not going to wait to be asked. 
They were going to support them and go down the line with them no matter what they did, which is rather revealing, I guess you'd say. Now, the other, the other uh, way that the Delphic Apollo expressed its pro-oligarchical tendencies is its support for the Persian Empire, because, of course, Greek history in this time is this endless war, century upon century, of trying to stand up against the constant encroachment of the Persian Empire, which they basically succeeded in holding off and ultimately uh, conquered, even though the Greeks by that time were weakened themselves. It is uh, the attack of uh, the Persian Emperor Xerxes, which uh, concerns us here. This is reported in Thucydides. The Athenians sent a delegation of two representatives to the Delphic Apollo, basically saying, well, Xerxes is, a, is attacking us. He's approaching. What should we do? And uh, this, is a, this is a remarkable opinion that was then tendered by the Delphic Apollo. The Delphic Apollo basically said, uh, you wretched men, what are you sitting here for? Fly to the ends of the earth and leave your homes in the topmost heights of your wheel-shaped city. The fierce, the fire and fierce Ares driving his Syrian car will destroy your city and he will lo lay low many other fenced cities and not yours alone. So after some more verbiage like this, depart from my sanctuary with your souls steeped in sorrow. This was the advice that the Delphic Oracle gave Athens at the moment that Xerxes was on the march. Now the two Athenians said, we can't go back with that. <laughs> We can't, you know, that's defeatist. That, that's going to ruin everything, right? No, but nobody's going to fight if they've heard that opinion from the Delphic Apollo. So what they did, they, they, they knew that there was a trick you could pull with the Delphic Apollo. You could get a second opinion. And the way you did that was you had to come then as a suppliant, not just as a client with gifts, but you had to come expressing uh, a great deal of... Uh, subordination to this thing. And you had to pick up what they called supplicatory branches. In other words, you had to some, come, come in with these boughs of laurel or myrtle or whatever it was. And therefore, can't you give us a second opinion? Right? Can't we have a better response for the country? And the Pythia at this point says, well, don't quietly await the cavalry and infantry that in a mighty host are advancing from the mainland, but turn your back and withdraw. You shall live to fight another day. And uh, mentions a few things about uh, maybe ships or the ocean or something like this. Um, they then this was this was also how basically saying run for your lives, although in a slightly less purple rhetoric. Uh, they went back these two Athenians to their uh, general Themistocles, and he was forced then to put his own spin on this, basically saying, well. Indeed, why don't we try fighting in the water instead of on land? And this is then the Battle of Salamis, which the Greeks won against the Persians. But no thanks to the, to the Delphic Oracle, right? Which was basically saying, run for your lives. And then when the Greeks, the, the Athenians, tried to give supplementary presents to the Delphic Oracle as a result of the victory, saying, well, you know, we, thanks to your prophecies we did prevail, the Delphic Oracle, this apparently the only time this ever happened, said, no, we can't take those presents from you, Athenians. So uh, this obviously gave the, gave the Delphic Oracle a, a bad name. Now, the other thing that the Delphic Oracle uh, did was its support of Rome. And I think this, this is the... Um, the thing that I wanted to look at just a little bit uh, also this evening. The Delphic Oracle is basically anti-Etruscan. Remember that in the Italian peninsula at the time, when you had Rome starting off, the most advanced civilizations were these Etruscans in the north, Tuscany, right, Florence, whatever, Po, Plain. And then in the south, from Naples all the way south, those were all Greeks. Right, that was the so-called Magna Graeca. And remember that Naples continued to speak Greek all through the Roman Empire until it went way into the Middle Ages. That was a Greek city and not, not Italian. Nevertheless, the Delphic Oracle supported Rome. And they did this with the same kind of public stress that you can see 
in the way that they supported Sparta or supported the Persian Empire against, against Athens and the other Greek uh, cities. During the course of uh, early Roman history, you have to remember that the Romans were this backward, uh, uncouth, brutal, murderous bunch compared to most of their neighbors. They were inferior. But the uh, Delphic Apollo supported them. For example, whenever they got into these wars with the Etruscan cities, like you, you read this in um, Titus Livius, right? Livy, the history of the Roman Republic. That whenever there's a, 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 a battle, a war going on between, say, Veii, Veii is a, is a large and relatively rich Etruscan city just a little bit north of Rome, that the Delphic Apollo was giving advice what to do, how the Romans could, could overturn Veii, and they did. Uh, at a later point, the Delphic Apollo decided that they would give an unprecedented permanent endorsement of Rome. And they did this by singling out a special black stone, which was called the Niger Lapis. Very interesting thing. Right? Niger Lapis, it just means black stone, that's all it means. The Blackstone Rangers, way back then. This was located in Greece, but it was the symbol of the Magna Mater. It was the great mother, uh, Cybele. This was supposedly the dwelling place of the goddess Cybele. So the Delphic Apollo put out an opinion that this black stone had to be moved, and it had to be taken from Greece and put in the Roman Forum. And that's where it stayed. And they, there still is in the Roman form today. If you go there, there's a black stone that they claim is the, is the one. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. Uh, during the, during the t so this was, a, this was a, a permanent endorsement. In other words, this, this is something that was never really done for anybody in quite that form. Now, later on, uh, in the Punic Wars, when Rome was fighting with, uh, with Carthage, right, the great thing that decided who was going to dominate the the central Mediterranean. During the days when Hannibal crossed his uh, elephants over the Alps and was laying waste to all parts of Italy, the Delphic Apollo sent messages of encouragement to the Senate and the people of Rome saying, hang on, keep fighting, don't give in, you can defeat Hannibal. And uh, ultimately did. This is pretty much what what happened. But again, with the help of the intelligence and the propaganda and the cults coming out of the Delphic Apollo. The other thing that we have to just recall is that in these days, after the death of Alexander the Great, there were kingdoms that grew up as the result of the falling apart of Alexander's empire. Right? These are the so-called, I guess they're sometimes called the Epigones, the Epigoni, Epigonoi. They're sometimes also called the diadochi, the, the generals. That, and if you were a big general under Alexander the Great, you had a pretty good chance of becoming king and founding a dynasty. And the cases of that that are most interesting are the Ptolemaic dynasty in Egypt. These were Greeks, basically, who set up a, a uh, kingdom here in Egypt. And then the so-called Seleucids. The Seleucids was, was another general and his gang who took over Syria. OK. Um, the Delphic Apollo liked the Ptolemaic uh, dynasty, supported them, uh, which is interesting. We'll get it later on when you get to, to Cleopatra, because that's, of course, what, what she was. Now, when the uh, Roman Empire came along, it's interesting to see which of the Roman emperors or proto-emperors were most supportive of the Delphic Apollo. Uh, Mark Antony, during the time that he dominated the eastern part of the Roman Empire, uh, came forward as a protector of the Delphic Apollo, saying, I'm going to rebuild this place. It was burned down, of course, a number of times. That I'm going I'm to fix it up again. The other emperors who um, were most in favor of the Delphic Apollo were uh, Nero, who uh, went there and uh, actually he he did some kind of an Indian giving operation. He gave them 100,000 sesterces, but then took away all their land, something like this. Domitian, uh, Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian. 
And it's interesting that the, there's, a, there's a definite pattern that the emperors that were most friendly to the Delphic Apollo were also the most ferocious in, in persecuting the, the early Christians. Now later, this guy Plutarch, right? We don't want to forget him. When the Delphic Apollo had been uh, more or less incorporated into the Roman system of things, Plutarch, the guy who writes these, these famous parallel lives, right, the lives of the noble Greeks and Romans, was a member of the priesthood. Right? He, was, he was somebody who operated as part of the priesthood of the, of the Delphic Apollo. The last attempt to revive this thing in its old glory was the emperor Julian the Apostate. Remember him. Remember, because Constantine became a Christian, so-called, and made the, you know, the, the official uh, uh, religion of the, the Roman Empire became Arian Christianity with, uh, with Constantine. But Julian the Apostate said, no, this is no good. Let's get back to the good old pagan ways. And he tried to build this significantly around the, uh, the uh, t Temple of Apollo at, uh, at Delphi. Now, the point of this is that this is the essence of what is metastasizing this, this thing. And again, it, it appears as a Greek institution, but what it really represents is this whore of Babylon faction. It is the Babylonian magi, the people that uh, pop up, for example, around the Roman court. Right? The, the most famous example, I think you may remember, is the emperor Tiberius, right? the one who presided over the crucifixion, had a Babylonian advisor by the name of Thrasyllus. Right? And every, people know the famous story about, about how Tiberius met Thrasyllus? Well, they're on this cliff of, of Capri, right? the island of uh, Capri near Naples. And what, what Tiberius would do is he would, he would test these different uh, soothsayers. And if he didn't like them, he'd have them thrown off the cliff. So here was Tiberius with, with a bunch of uh, centurions and guards. And um, he went up to Thrasyllus and he said, let's, let's see if this guy knows what's going on. So he asked him a couple of questions. He said, well, what do you see in my future? And Thrasyllus looks into his crystal ball or his bird entrails or whatever it is he had. And he said, wait a minute. I, my picture is completely blurred by the fact that my life is in extreme danger. <laughs> and Tiberius said, this guy knows what's going on. Let's get him. So that's... That's the type of the, of the Babylonian mages. And these, these are the people that were present in the uh, Roman Empire. Now, the way Lynn sums this stuff up now, what I'm going to try to do is to, is to put a little bit of meat and bones on a, on a sort of a skeleton that, that, that Lynn sets up where he says that after the defeat of Carthage and Macedonia, and we can look at this in a second, it took about 150 years to figure out where the capital of the Roman Empire would be, who would be the dominant people, and how this would all happen, right? And get rid of all of the other pretenders, so forth. But that the way that this happened was always under the influence of this Eastern force, this Babylonian, Magi, uh, and Delphic Apollo. And that the center of gravity of the Roman Empire was always in the east, right? And that places like Syria and Turkey and Greece remained Roman Empire long after Spain and France and Italy were not. See? Rome was not Rome anymore, but there was a, still a Roman Empire in the east for an extra thousand years. So somehow the roots of this phenomenon, right, the roots of the Roman imperial phenomenon are the deepest in the eastern Mediterranean. And that's the center of gravity of the entire thing. And you can see this as you trace the course of these different uh, civil wars. Now, let's just go through it, right? The Punic Wars. Here, we'll just try to, we'll try to make short shrift of this stuff, right? Because it, otherwise it becomes this immense, uh, you know, uh, Oxford Dictionary of Classical Civilization and all this stuff. You had, you had three Punic Wars. It's Rome against Carthage, with the Delphic Apollo rooting for Rome. So that's 264 to 146 BC. Yeah. No, no, it's Tunisia. Still there. You go there today, and this is really funny. What you, funny. 
which you go to Carthage, right? The ruins are there. They, at least there's, they, the, the old story was that the Romans destroyed this place so completely that they even poured salt in the ground and nothing could ever grow there. You go there today and there's the ruins. There are the ruins of what appears to be a, an old, you know, Roman city, 300 AD, whatever. But the one thing that is Carthaginian is that there are these little stone boxes stone like a shoe box. Shoe boxes, but made of stone, made of marble. And you go and you say, what is that? Well, the Carthaginian religion, if you call it that, prescribed that you had to sacrifice your firstborn son to the ruler and to the god. So those were the poor little babies that were killed as a matter of state policy. All of them had to die and were put into these little shoe boxes. And you see them, they line the whole place. They're just all over the place. When you go to what is today called Carthage, right? So they have, you know, they have a, a rock and roll stage there, right? There's a, a place to have the summer festival. Okay, so that's, and, and these were bad, right? These are Phoenicians, right? Hannibal was certainly a good general, but uh, this was a bad scene. And, and the, the culture was, uh, you know, this was just, was, I think I've said enough. So the three Punic Wars against Carthage, these were the decisive ones, right? So this was essentially who was going to dominate the central Mediterranean. And Rome, again, with the help of the Delphic Apollo, won these things. If you want one date, the Battle of Zama, because it's, it's, we always talk about Cannae, right? Cannae is where Hannibal defeated the Romans. But Scipio Africanus, the Roman, then turned around and did the same thing to Hannibal at Zama in a somewhat less uh, exemplary military thing. But this, that was basically the end of uh, Hannibal. You then had, you had three Macedonian wars. The other power that was left in the middle of this uh, Mediterranean was uh, Macedonia, right? The basis of, of uh, Alexander's old empire. And that was all finished by 168 BC. For those who are keeping score, that was called the Battle of Pydnia, quite famous in the ancient world. There was a Syrian war against the remnants of this Seleucid uh, dynasty. So basically, when all is said and done, the result is that by 150 BC, everybody's defeated. Carthage is defeated, Macedonia is defeated, Syria defeated, and Rome rules the world. In which you already have a Roman Empire by 150 BC, which I think is a little bit surprising if people have thought about these, these chronologies. You think it usually, oh, that came much later, right? It came around the time of the birth of Christ, right? It came around, you know, 20 BC. But no, Rome was an empire. And it was already thoroughly decadent. All this, you know, all the horrible stuff you see associated with, you know, Nero and Caligula and people like that, that was all going immediately by about the middle of, of the, uh, the second century BC. This was a real bad scene. And of course, they were already decadent before they had any literature, right? It, it was this, the Scipio Africanus and his group that basically concocted a literature around this, uh, around this time. Now, the question, therefore, is between 150 BC and about 30 BC, when I guess we can say that, uh, that uh, Augustus consolidated the, uh, the Roman Empire. I just want to check my dates here. I wouldn't want to be wrong. It approximately, uh, yeah, that's, that's just, just exactly right. So here's a period of 120 years of civil war and all kinds of wars, but all within the Roman world now, all within the framework of this dominant Roman Empire. It's, it calls itself Roman Republic, but it's an empire in every sense. So before you can get a fairly stable dynasty, you've got to have 120 years of civil war. Now let's just, I'll just mention a couple of these things uh, to you, the way, that it, uh, the way that it worked. First of all, the attempted reforms of Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus. Remember that um, as a result of winning the Punic Wars, defeating Carthage, the Romans picked up Sicily. So 
So what did they do with Sicily? Sicily was the richest agricultural area in the entire Mediterranean that had the capability of feeding everybody. And the big policy issue, and this is what the Gracchi were interested in, was if you divided Sicily up and made it into family farms, you would have had a relatively prosperous, well-fed Mediterranean world. But that's not what the Roman Empire, Roman Republic did. They made it into Latifundia, and they cultivated it with slaves. And that decision, that stuff was all decided between 200 and 150 BC. So pretty much the die was cast. And what the Gracchi then tried to do, I wouldn't you know, think that the Gracchi were anything that great, but they simply said, we wish to distribute this to the poorest citizens, war veterans, and so forth. But that was too much for the senatorial party in Rome, who then killed them. And that really set off this 120 years of civil war. Now, the warlords of this period are a fascinating uh, uh, phenomenon. And some of these, I mean, Julius Caesar, I guess people know. But some of these others are, are absolutely extraordinary. There are two parties that come out of this. There's the so-called aristocratic party, which was led by a guy called Sulla. And the so-called plebeian party, led by another warlord called Marius. I guess these guys are forgotten today. They're not, they're not uh, too, uh, too well known. Well, that's, that's, that's the way fame is. Um, <laughs> Marius became famous because he was able to defeat the Germanic barbarians in southern France, in Aix-en-Provence. He won the Battle of Aix-en-Provence and defeated these blonde-headed characters. Uh, Marius was associated with another guy called Cinna. You know, in, in Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, where the guy says, I'm Cinna the poet, I'm Cinna the poet, and he says, tear him anyway, tear him, tear him. This guy, these two, Marius was the general, and Cinna was sort of the Labrinti Beria, right, the Gestapo. He went around killing everybody. And this was called proscriptions. Now, remember, in, if you remember uh, Antony and Cleopatra, in these other plays by Shakespeare with a the guy, they have these lists. And they say, OK, I'm going to put a dot next to everybody who's going to die. And the guy says, OK, your brother's going to get it. He says, yeah, and your nephew's going to get it as they go through it, right? Because they're, they're going to kill everybody. So this is, this is pretty much what they did. Now, Sulla conquered Greece. He finished off the conquest of Greece. He conquered Athens. He was the first Roman general into Athens. Sulla is also the first Roman to conquer Rome was the first Roman to, liter to militarily take over his own city. And Marius then did the same shortly thereafter. So this is called the social war. The other thing that got involved in this is, was everybody in Italy going to be a Roman citizen, or would some be Roman citizens and some not? And all the privileges and stuff that went with that, as you know, for example, from the life of St. Paul. And a civil war, and the proscriptions. So uh, the social war, the civil war, yeah. No, I think Coriolanus is, is a separate person, isn't it? Person. Okay. Yes, it's a, it's a different person. Now, where Coriolanus comes in on this stuff, now you got me. I don't know. Where does Coriolanus come in? I think earlier. I think Coriolanus is earlier than this. Right. Well, look, what came out of this is Marius had a nephew, OK? And that's Julius Caesar. And out of the Sulla group, you get, uh, in particular, Pompey, Pompey the Great, and El Crassus. So what it simply means is that these two guys fight a civil war for several decades, and then they are superseded by another generation of warlords. But see, now the warlord stuff has taken on a life of its own. And there's a whole part of the population that have been nothing but these Wallenstein bandits, right? So it becomes a uh, social phenomenon in that sense. So now we get Julius Caesar, Pompey the Great, and El Crassus. Now, up to now, it was Marius against Sulla. That's passe. Now it's a three-way division. And this is what they call the first triumvirate. Now, El Crassus. Money, money, big money. He's a tycoon, 
millionaire and brutal political boss, Perot. <laughs> the Perot of first century Rome was El Crassus. Now, what he did, this is actually funny, he, he, uh, he, he got into messing with the, the, uh, the Persian Empire, the Parthian Empire. Because no matter what the Romans did, they could not conquer what is today Iraq. They never made it. In other words, the Euphrates, the Euphrates River was something the Romans never could permanently get beyond. And beyond the Euphrates, there was always this thing that called itself Persian Empire or Parthian Empire, and then again, Persian Empire. So El Crassus said, look, I'm taking the money. He went into Syria, looted all the temples, crossed the Euphrates, started looting. The Persian army came in and defeated him and killed him. And then they took his dead body, this is what Dante records in the Divine Comedy, and poured molten gold into the mouth of the corpse to say, look, you wanted it, now you're going to get it. <laughs> Tell us what it tastes like, Crassus. What's the flavor of gold? So these guys all, they all died. They all came to a bad end. Julius Caesar, you know, he conquered what was left of Spain, France, England, up to Scotland, but was then killed by this conspiracy, right? This is the one thing that people know. Pompey is actually more interesting from our point of view tonight. And what he did is that Pompey is the one who added the Eastern Mediterranean to the Roman Empire, which Pompey did get as far as the Euphrates and permanently added most of that. For example, the, uh, if you remember, how did the Romans get Jerusalem? How did they conquer what is today Israel and the Holy Land? Pompey the Great did that. So he basically took Turkey, Syria, Jerusalem, and the Maccabees were trying to resist Pompey the Great. Right? That, was, that was one of the, at least one of the phases of the, uh, of the Maccabees. So, uh, this rapidly went, obviously, the way that it had to go. Uh, Caesar, well, Crassus was out of the picture with his gold. Caesar then got into a, a fight with Pompey. And this then led to this battle of Pharsalia, which was won decisively by Caesar. And Pompey fled across to Egypt and was murdered. And then shortly thereafter, Caesar was murdered. So they're all dead. The whole first triumvirate were all slaughtered. Now, the interesting thing about Pompey is that he gives you the idea of somebody who wanted this Eastern-centered empire. In other words, his main base was the Roman East. That's what, that's what he conquered. And when he got into the final phase of the Civil War with Caesar, he went to Greece and tried to draw strength from Turkey, Syria, Palestine, Egypt, and try to fight based on that, although he failed. Pompey also, Pompey actually got all the way around the Black Sea. He got into what is today Georgia. Uh, extraordinary, right, the, the, the way in which these, these things were, were done. But it's, of course, it's, it's just horrible because it's one continuous slaughter. And then we get um, this um, second, the second triumvirate, the one that you know, you know then from, uh, from Julius Caesar by Shakespeare, which is Mark Antony, Octavian, and Lepidus. And Octavian, of course, was this um, sort of androgynous, uh, you know, dubious sexual uh, orientation <coughs> character. Mark Antony was a, was a uh, you know, brutal political organizer and, and uh, infighter. And Lepidus was a person, I guess, of re relatively little consequence. They gave him Africa, and, then, and that was the end of him. Uh, the interesting thing about this phase is that when we get to this, it very soon became that Octavian, the later Augustus, had the West, and Mark Antony had the East. And Mark Antony's basic policy was the uh, Cleopatra card. And Cleopatra, Cleopatra represented not, not what you think. And it was not, not just this you know, hedonistic uh, apparatus. right? But what Cleopatra represented was the idea that the capital of the Roman Empire should be in Alexandria, and that it should be an Eastern-centered empire from the word go. Now, they, this is actually what they tried to do. You see, Cleopatra had cohabited with Julius Caesar for a while. So she had 
the principal living biological heir of Julius Caesar was her son that she kept. This is known as Ptolemy Caesar, or Caesarion. And uh, one ceremony that they held when Mark Antony was with Cleopatra in Alexandria, they basically had this proclamation, which was read by Mark Antony, that Cleopatra was the queen of kings and that little Caesarion was the king of kings, that he was essentially the Roman emperor, but in Alexandria. So there's the, there you see it, I think, most clearly, that the, the fight was about whose dynasty was going to rule, where would the capital be, and what other arrangements would go into this. But the, the general framework had already been set up by the Delphic uh, oracle. So then, as people know, the, uh, the way in which this was then finally decided, and I, I, I promised I would look into this a bit more, because I think it's, this is another fascinating episode, is that Augustus, or Octavian, wanted to secure the support of this Babylonian Magi faction, the Delphic Apollo group, and that he therefore met with their representatives on the island of Capri and said, well, look, uh, I will certainly cultivate the Magna Mater and Sibel in Rome, but otherwise what I will do is I will bring in Mithra, I will bring in the Mithra cult from the east and make that the principal cult of the Roman legions. Now this Mithra, right, Mithra is this, uh, Mithra is, is a religion that is explicitly based on homosexuality. Uh, it's a, uh, if you go to Wiesbaden, for example, one of the, one of the interesting things in Wiesbaden along the Rhine, wherever Roman legions went, you will find a Mithraeum. And the Mithraeum is a kind of an underground temple which has got to do with this bull, which is stung then by a scorpion. And there's this youth called Mithra, I believe, who's also part of the picture. Um, for example, one of, one of the kings running around in, uh, in the Black Sea at this time is King M Mithradates, right? So he's basically, he's the living representative of Mithra. So uh, that's how it was done. And it meant then that the Roman legions, which were the most important single institution in the entire thing, they were very largely homosexual, and they were then filled with this Mithra cult. And maybe just before we, we leave this, the Roman legion had been set up in its modern form, modern form, modern form for them, by Marius, and it was essentially this group of 6,000 people with this heavy armament, and they found that they could defeat the uh, Macedonian phalanx, that the Roman legion was unbeatable and remained so at least for, for a certain amount of, of time. The principal social institution of the empire was the legion, and it was the legions who chose the emperor, in effect, but always under the guise under the guidance of these, uh, these spin doctors. All right. With that, I guess we've had, a, we've had a, an interesting uh, look, I hope, into, into what, what this period of 130, 150 years of civil war was actually like. Now, let's, let us conclude with the question of Diocletian, OK? Because we'll have to, we'll have to uh, continue next time. Well, I don't know what to do. Uh, now, in, in terms of this Roman Empire, um, the first bunch of emperors, as you know, were these monsters, right? Uh, Augustus, well, Augustus kept it a little bit under control, but then we had Tiberius and Nero and Claudius and Caligula, and this was simply a bloodbath, right, as, as people know. Right? There's just no, no limit to this stuff. After that, there was a certain backlash against it, and you had these other Flavian emperors who basically said, no, no, we, we don't want to have that. We don't want to have quite as much killing as we had in the Tiberius. We're not like that, right? This is when Tacitus was allowed to write and Suetonius was allowed to write, basically saying, we're not like those bad old emperors that have been around. And you go through this period of about, what, 150 years of Pax Romana, right? It was a long piece, but it didn't last forever. And that's the interesting thing that gets us to to Diocletian and the, these points that are of perhaps most interest uh, today. 
See, the collapse of the Roman Empire actually came quicker than most people think. Uh, if we think of the year 180 AD, we have Marcus Aurelius. Right? Has anybody ever seen that movie with uh, Alec Guinness, The Fall of the Roman Empire? With Marcus Aurelius is up on the Danube fighting the Germanic tribes? No? It's been on cable lately. <laughs> you see? <laughs> now, he was already, the big thing with Marcus Aurelius was that he was fighting these Votan guys, right? The guys who were yelling Votan and coming to kill you, right? As, as best they could. And what you had then was a period of about 100 years of absolute collapse, and it got to be worse. The worst phase was from about 230 AD to 280 AD. So it was a collapse that began in 180 AD, and it was principally the pressure of Goths, Vandals, right, other of these tribes coming out of Central Asia along all the borders of the empire. So along the Rhine, along the Danube, and the Euphrates, right? But especially the Rhine and the Danube were the most threatened. And really, the entire Roman Empire basically collapsed by about 280 AD, with civil wars, right? Provinces going off under warlords, as we've seen before. Now, Diocletian, is the person who tried to fix this. And uh, he fixed it in a way which, uh, from which Europe really did not recover for certainly 500 years, but really for 1,000 years. It took 1,000 years to get over the wonderful reforms of, uh, of Diocletian. So this was an attempt to revive the Roman Empire reorganize it and endow it with greater stability. And this is therefore, this is immediately germane to all of the stuff that's going around us politically uh, today. Now, Diocletian was a kind of a commoner. He was not a representative of the senatorial families or of the Babylonian Magi uh, directly. But he was somebody who had grown up in warfare, civil wars, fighting these barbarians. He was from Dalmatia. So in effect, he was a Croatian. I mean, if, if he was anything, he was a Croatian. Now, he decided to institute these reforms. Now, I'm going to try to go through them in sort of ascending order of importance. So we get to the really important stuff at the end. We'll start with some of the stuff that's rather, rather interesting. Um, he said, first of all, that the, uh, the Roman Empire had to have a, an administrative reform that it was no good to have one emperor, but that the empire had to be divided east and west. But he actually divided it four ways. This is the so-called tetrarchy. And what he did was he said, well, first of all, we're going to divide it east and west. And in the east, we're going to have one senior emperor, an Augustus, and one junior emperor, a Caesar, a Caesar. And we'll do the same thing in the east. We'll have a senior, senior emperor, me, and then we'll have a junior Caesar. So Augustus, better, and Caesar, inferior to that. So where were they located? Well, he said, I'm going to put one in Trier in Germany to guard the Rhine. Then I'm going to put an Augustus in Milan to guard the Alps and the, you know, what they would call Gaul, right, the southern part of Gaul. A third of these emperors operated from the Sava River in the middle of what, is, well, what was Yugoslavia until recently. And Diocletian himself chose to operate from at the very edge of Europe on the, on the shores of the Sea of Marmara, opposite Turkey. So he was basically on the coast of Europe looking over to Asia across the Sea of Marmara. That is where Diocletian himself chose to operate from. Now, Diocletian wanted respect. He wanted respect. So what he did was he took what he understood to be 
the court ritual of the Persian Empire and introduced it into the Roman Empire, which meant, for example, Unix, right? As the, as the, computer, the computer people would say, he had a Unix-based system. Uh, so his, the court was full of these eunuchs, right, and with everything that goes with that, right? And it's one of these historians here, this guy, John Julius Norwich, he writes, he says, if you ever known a eunuch, you know that you don't want to cross them. <laughs> don't ever get on the wrong side of a eunuch. Uh, so he, this entire thing that, that he was deified. Now, but what, what you think of as the Byzantine Empire really starts with this, that the emperor is a god. He was called Jovius, Jovius. He's the, the earthly representative of Zeus as Augustus. And then his other guy, the second Augustus, the, the junior Augustus, was called Hercules. Because he's also a god, but he's sort of more earthbound, and he's the guy who's really strong and helps Jovius to do, to do all the important uh, stuff. Now, they, uh, they had to do the military reform. Now, this is called Diocletian's Peace Dividend. You saw that uh, under Marius, the Roman legion had about 6,000 men. So Diocletian said, no, no, that's too much. We want to have uh, lean and mean units. So now, the legion is only going to be 1,000. And he had, he had an estimated... He increased the army, actually, from 400,000 to one half million. That's what he left it at. One half million men under arms. Quite large, huh? Now, he also did this. He divided them between garrison troops and field troops. And the interesting thing is, what he wanted to defend was the so-called limes, now, you see all those books talking about limes, right? And probably, what does it mean? It simply means the border, right? Limes limitis means the frontier, the border. In particular, it means something like Hadrian's Wall up in Scotland, right, on the border with Scotland, or Trajan's Wall over in Romania, right? So you have these walls, like the Great Wall of China, right, but smaller. So there were some troops were called limitanei, and those were the garrison troops that staffed the walls and the border. And then you had others who were, were the mobile units and stuff like this. So it's also interesting that a lot of the, um, a lot of the, the uh, words that are associated with European nobility, like dux, right? A dux, a duke was originally a lower grade officer of these legions, or a count, a comes, comes comitis, was a higher ranking officer. Interestingly, it's reversed compared to what you'd, what you'd think. OK. Now, of course, the main thing was money. It was taxation. Taxation. Does that sound familiar? Huh? You can imagine, if you want to have an imperial reorganization. So here's what he did. Diocletian said, we have to have the predictability of revenue. So he got into this sort of, no, no. He, he did it in a different way. It's actually, it's more sinister. He did it in this sort of doomsday book way. In other words, what he wanted was a census to know all of the wealth of the empire. And that was then going to be taxed. And it was taxed through uh, what is called capitatio. Capitatio is head tax. Sometimes it turned into decapitatio <laughs> when you got finished paying. But this was on all wealth. There were also, there were other kinds of assessments to sort of... In, in indictio, which was a, something that they would proclaim at different points every five years or something like this. Now, the tax burden was increased. And this essentially destroyed society. Already with this, he was destroying society. And here is how it worked. He said, if we have a Roman province, and he had, he had made more of them, right? He had about 100 provinces. He said, I'm going to make the city council of the principal city and the other cities, they will be personally responsible for paying the taxes, which I'm going to assess based on this census, right, this doomsday book operation that I've got, to know what the wealth is. Now, the people who were therefore called to pay 
were these, uh, you'd call them the bourgeoisie, I suppose, right? In other words, the, the, the well-to-do middle class and traders of the towns, they were the ones who were left holding the bag. And here's the way it would work. You already had, by this time, barons. There was somebody with a huge farm, a huge latifundium, and slaves, and a fortress sitting in the middle. And these poor guys from the city would come out and they'd say, hey, baron, time to pay your taxes, right? And the guy would start shooting arrows or pouring molten lead over the walls. <laughs> and they couldn't collect the tax. But Diocletian's boys said, wait a minute, you're now responsible for the tax. And these, so these, these bourgeoisie types said, well, what, us? Then they attempted in the cities to tax the lower orders in the cities. And they got, from this they got class war. In other words, they got, they got revolutions in the cities. And ultimately, it turned out that people said, well, if this is what it means to be a well-to-do middle class person in the Roman city, I'm leaving. I'm going to join the army. I'm going to become a monk, a bandit, a wayfarer, whatever. And then Diocletian turned around and said, wait a minute, you can't do that. I am making your station in life hereditary and compulsory. In other words, if you're a bourgeois of the city, you're going to stay in the city, and your son, your oldest son, is going to be forced to take your place. And he has no choice in the matter. And you'll see that this got to be an important, uh, important principle. So the towns were destroyed by the taxes. Then the other people were the so-called coloni, tenant farmers. So they then had a heavy burden of tax that they had to bear. They, the, what, what Diocletian originally said is you should pay in kind. In other words, you, you should be a sharecropper, basically. Pay part of your tax with, with food or whatever your crop is. But they then began to build up tremendous amounts of debts also. So they basically said, let's go on to the next province. So, you know, let's see what the Parthian Empire looks like, right? <laughs> let's try that. And then Diocletian turned around and said, wait a minute, you can't. You are now bound to the land. It is now illegal to leave the land. And that is serfdom. Now, that is the origin of, Euro of European serfdom, was that the people on the land, these coloni, the sharecroppers and others, who were theoretically free, were then bound to the land to prevent them from getting out from under this crushing tax burden. All right, so you've also got now the phenomenon of lawlessness. Uh, society is collapsing, right? The tissue of society is collapsing as a result of all this stuff, because some people are running away, right? They're bandits and, and warlords and so forth. So the idea is that everybody tries to build up some kind of an impregnable fortress somewhere to operate out of there. And this is the so-called patrocinium. It's feudalism. In other words, it basically says, well, I'm just a little sharecropper. I'm now a serf. Lord, will you... Take me into your entourage. Will you, can I become a part of your operation so that when the Huns come, I can take refuge in your castle and so forth? It's what you see in Bosnia or Croatia or these other places. As soon as you have warlords, you've got to join one of these gangs. Otherwise, you're going to be caught in the middle uh, and ground up. Now, it gets worse. Now, what I'm describing, these are called Diocletian's reforms. But in, in many cases, they were only completed under Constantine. And of course, Constantine is the one who then made this division of the Eastern and Western Roman Empire permanent. He's the, he's the founder of the Orthodox Church, right? He's iso-apostolic. But here's what he did, and, al along with Diocletian. Diocletian's, one of Diocletian's last things was his price control decree. De maximis pretiis. Maximum prices. So this was 301 AD, and he said, I am hereby setting maximum prices for approximately 1,000 of the most important items. So all kinds of food, wheat, bread, all kinds of wine, sheep, gold, labor in different... Right? So in other words, a, a completely totalitarian approach to economics. If you want to know, for example, where communism comes from, this is where communism comes from the tendency of the Byzantine society to be 
uh, to view economic activity as a fully controlled department of the, of the state. So it's what essentially this then led to was chaos. Was, it was obviously a, a tremendous black market. It, it, it reminded me, when you read these descriptions, you think of Russia today. It was if you, if you try to have these kinds of economic dislocations, even though it's going in the opposite direction, you're going to get a black market, profiteering, the economy of scarcity, raids to try to seize, hoarding, all this kind of stuff. So, so far we've got Diocletian brings you feudalism, serfdom, and now we have the guilds. And this is, this is actually the most interesting. See, we always say that Diocletian reforms forbade technological innovation. Now, you think of this in Latin, there's really no e way even to say that or to think it, right? You can't say, you know, alterare technologiam non licet. <laughs> it, 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 it doesn't, and this is not the way they did it. They, they didn't come out and say, you're not allowed to have technological change. Here's what they did. The production was organized according to these guilds, corporations, right, in the sense of the medieval corporations, the, one that, the ones that, uh, you know, Mussolini talked about, or Gabriele D'Annunzio, these, these, you know, sorts of people. So you had these guilds. Now, they started off with ship owners, the people who actually owned boats that were used for transportation. So again, as in all of these areas, people were trying to get out. They were trying to say, look, I can't stay here. I'm losing money, and I can't stay. I want to leave. And the, the, the Roman state of Diocletian said, no, no, wait a minute. Your function is compulsory and hereditary. And it, again, it meant that if you were born to a family of the ship owners guild, that was your destiny. You had to do it, you know, presumably on, on pain of death. And then this was expanded. They thought that worked so well that they took the millers, the bakers, the butchers, the shoemakers, the carpenters, the bricklayers, and all of the other principal trades and made these compulsory and hereditary. And then, of course, the technology part comes in in the following way. They then said, we're defending these guilds. It is illegal to alter or buy or sell the property of a guild. And that was it. See, once you've said that, then you have said, in effect, that no technological change is allowed. You see, we're defending the guilds. We want stability. We want sustainable development. We're going to fix everybody into these posts, right? You've got your profession determined from birth. The property of the guild is sacrosanct, can't be changed. And therefore, we've got it. And of course, what they had then was 500, well, probably about three or 400 years straight down in most of the world in which this was applied, which was a significant uh, part of the world. This was then the very, very long night of the Dark Ages. Uh, this, was, uh, this was the collapse of the, of the tissue of civilization in a way that has, has hardly ever been seen uh, before. And of course, everybody retreating into these little fortresses, surfed them, the guilds, the cities essentially collapsing, emptying out, grass growing. Right? Rome itself, a sheep meadow, once again, after not too long. And so on. So that's, uh, that's Diocletian. Now, uh, we can probably just go on a little bit further if people still have blood sugar for it. And just what we may be able to do is just to begin to account for some of the, some of the moments of metastasis in here after Diocletian. See, what you have with Diocletian is it's still the Roman world, but it's beginning to show you the Dark Ages and feudalism. But feudalism in its ugly, backward, you know, brutal, gangster-ridden, uh, genocidal uh, aspect. Well, the, well, yeah. No, I think we can, we can go on for a few more minutes. I just want to, give you, I just want to begin to show, begin to indicate some of the, uh, the transition points into, into, uh, from Byzantium to Venice, maybe another 10 or 15 minutes, OK? I, really, I don't really have a plan that detail. No, I just had a question. Sure, go ahead. Diocletian becomes emperor. Well, you, um, during this time, I mean, if you begin to look at these emperors, by the time you get into the the 200s and the uh, the 200s in particular, 
is that uh, you have an emperor who's an Arab, you have emperor, you have a number of emperors who I believe were black, you have uh, many emperors killed, you have you know rival emperors at different points, uh, and above all generals. Right? It was, if you were proclaimed by the legion, you were the emperor, and if you know you could you could have you could say well I you know my family is. 10,000 years old, and the centurion would put a spear through you, and that would be the end of you. So it, it was, uh, to that extent, it was, it was a, a wild, it was a civil war. I mean, really what you get the idea is, except for that Pax Romana, except for this a period of relative exhaustion in the century or so after Augustus, it was one civil war from beginning to end. Although when you get to Diocletian, it begins to get into this fixed, mode, but of course then the, the constant local warfare going on becomes the big, the big thing, and then of course ultimately the, uh, the invasions. So he, he did not, you know, he was, it was not a patrician empire at that point. It was basically people who were, uh, you know, desperate adventurers. It's very funny, you look at Diocletian. Diocletian considered himself to be an administrator, rational, and a, a, fi a financier. He said, look, he said, I'm I'm a better financier than Vespasian, and I'm a better uh, administrator than Augustus. You know that Vespasian was the guy who introduced pay toilets. <laughs> the, the Italian and French word for an outdoor toilet is Vespasiano, or Vespasien, right? And this was, uh, this was uh, um, Vespasian. He's earlier. He's, he's not so late. And they asked him, they said, Vespasian, don't you, don't you feel that uh, somehow you know, this money coming into the treasury from these paid toilets is somehow an insult? And this is the famous pecunia non olet. That money doesn't smell to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it, it's a nightmare. Although there are, I mean, it, it's, it, <laughs> you can't trivialize this stuff, though, because you, what you have to think of is, is, is Diocletian. I mean, think of Diocletian. Think of that administrative machine with his 500,000 troops, and he's telling you what to do with your life. Right? He's, <laughs> he's telling you what you're going to do down in, you know, into the smallest detail. In other words, it's totalitarianism. It's totalitarianism, and it's a world government. In other words, it is exactly what this UN thing would be. Now, you look at somebody like Boutros Boutros Ghali. Look at some of these people. Look at that guy, that, that Japanese guy in Bosnia, As Ahashi or whatever his name is. Right? You look at these people. What are you dealing with? You're dealing with these Roman imperial administrators in, in some kind of a new form. But anyway, look, out of this uh, collapse, let's just, we'll just try to get some idea of, this, of the transition from, from Byzantium to Venice. Now, remember, Rome in the, in the West, Right? As every schoolboy used to know, the end of the Roman Empire in the West was... No? Huh? This is what every schoolboy used to know. What? No, come on. 476 AD. Oh, my gosh. The Roman history wasn't, uh, wasn't too popular. Um, this is what they say, anyway. No, no. The sack of Rome is... is the, the, the sack of Rome is about 150 years before that, but this is supposedly the complete end of the whole thing. And of course, you can, you can dispute this, right? You can say it's 50 years earlier or 50 years later. But remember, in, in light of this thesis that the, the real center of the Roman Empire was in the east, and that the capital of the Roman Empire, if it had been Sulla, if it had been Pompey, or if it had been Mark Antony, the capital would probably have been Alexandria or someplace like that in the east. Rome East goes another thousand years, right? Up until 1453 AD, right? And the fall of Constantinople. And that, that again, is the, it's a nightmare vision, because that's pretty much under Diocletian, this Diocletian-Constantine regime as reformed about 500 by Justinian. Ooh. All right, but that then brings us to, uh, to Venice. Now, um, how in God's name did this imperial eagle, right, this purple-trimmed imperial eagle 
of the Roman Empire. How did this end up in Venice, in this strange lagoon at the northern end of the Adriatic uh, Sea? How, how, did, how did the empire, so to speak, pass that way? Well, it actually, it grows. The origins of this, at least in the legends, are not so far from Diocletian and Constantine, right? The original idea is that the people who founded Venice were looking for a refuge. Uh, at this point, right, in, in line with this patrocinium that I was talking about in these private fortresses and barons, right, the barony, uh, the typical thing is a Benedictine monastery, right? You look at Mont Saint-Michel in France, right? It's a Benedictine monastery. It's a fortress off the edge of the coast with only quicksand in between. Or then you look at Monte Cassino, another Benedictine monastery, right? A fortress, enough to be a fortress in the Second World War, which it was. And then Venice is another such example, again, a Benedictine monastery, a bit later, uh, in this lagoon center. Now, the people who, who settled Venice were allegedly fleeing from the Goths to start with, but ultimately it was uh, Attila the Hun. At least that's the legend. So the, the, official, the official legendary foundation of Venice is not so long after uh, Diocletian. It's, it's 421 AD, I believe. Again, people running away from Attila the Hun who gathered in the middle of the lagoon at the Rialto or someplace like this and decided that they were going to that they were going to stay there. Uh, now, who knows? I, I certainly can't tell you, but it's an interesting legend. The, ele the election of the first doge is approximately 700 AD, they claim. But wh when can you say that this metastasis begins? In other words, that some, there's some identifiable phenomenon that that the center of oligarchism in Byzantium is being moved into, into Venice. And I guess, well, certainly 800 AD is an important date, right? this period of, of Charlemagne. Because the way in which Venice was actually consolidated was in a war against Charlemagne. But Charlemagne wanted to destroy Venice. Uh, this was a good thing to do. And he had, he had uh, Pepin as a general attacking Venice but unfortunately not being able to, to wipe it out. And this, this war went on for quite a while. You see, what the Venetians did at this point was they felt that they were strong enough to say, we are not part of Western civilization. That was the, 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 the fundamental self-assertion that they made. We're not part of Charlemagne's empire. We are part of the Byzantine empire. That was, that was how they pulled themselves together. Uh, they, they denied that they were part of Italy and the West and that they wanted to be, the, and this was actually propaganda. In other words, when, when you had Pepin's forces on the mainland saying, you know, how do you dare to oppose the Emperor Charlemagne? And they say, no, we support the Byzantine Emperor. We're his, his guys. So the key moment is 811 AD, the Pax Nicephori. And the Pax Nicephori is essentially a treaty between the Byzantine emperor and Charlemagne, who at this point was just about dying, he was at the very end of his life, saying, OK, Venice is part of the Byzantine Empire. So with that, they had it. In other words, they had gotten all of the main contenders to agree that they were something very, very special, that they were not, not indeed uh, part of the West. Now, you read these, uh, these Venetian stories, and you'll, you'll see that at, during these, the next couple of hundred years, the first Byzantine princesses began to arrive, because it now became the best way to promote your family was to bring in a Byzantine princess for a bride. And it, you, there are these accounts where these Venetians say, look, she's got this thing. She's got this little metal contraption. And when she sees something she wants to eat, she skewers it and puts it in her mouth. <laughs> they'd never seen a fork until the, Byzantine, until the Byzantine princesses arrived. And what you also see is that they hated these Byzantine princesses. And indeed, that, that quite a number of them died relatively soon after coming into Venice.
<laughs> so uh, that's I would say this this period of the Byzantine princesses is something about you know eight eight hundred to a thousand A.D. But now you're building up towards the, towards the big important date, and and I think the moment when you can say that the transition is actually made is this period about 1200 A.D., which is your Fourth Crusade. And you know the story, right? We have the, the Doge of Venice, Enrico Dandolo, who is in touch with these French feudal knights, right, who were, you know, backward and clods, opes, militarists, whatever, but greedy, dumb. And for some reason, they said, oh, well, we have to go on this pilgrimage to Jerusalem and free the holy sites and the sepulcher of the Lord from the Saracens, right, the Arabs, from Muhammad. And uh, they get to Venice. They don't have any money. So the Venetians say, look, uh, we'll, go, we'll take you to, Constant uh, to, uh, to Jerusalem, but first, let's try to knock off a local city here in the Adriatic that's been giving us trouble. And I think they decide that they're going to go to Zara, one of these other, one of these Italian cities on the other side of, of the Adriatic. So they go there and conquer that. And the Venetians say, okay, now we're going to take you to Jerusalem, except they don't take them to Jerusalem. They take them to Constantinople. And these French guys say, all right, Constantinople, it's all the same. And they then attack, conquer, and destroy Constantinople, including the burning of the library. Right? And between, if you want to keep track of these things, the burning of the Alexandrian library during the Antony and Cleopatra episode knocked out a lot of what we would have known about the ancient world. But the really big one was the destruction of the library in Constantinople by the Venetians and these French oafs in the Fourth Crusade of 1200 AD. And this, these funny stories. Have you ever seen these four horses? They're these four bronze horses that stood at the Hippodrome, the racetrack, in downtown Constantinople, Byzantium. And the Venetians got these. And they took them to Venice. Right? And they're now displayed on the front porch of St. Mark's Basilica. And there are these four horses. And the way that they got them was this was a crusade right, against the infidel, but of course it, it just destroyed the biggest Christian city uh, that was there. The, the only poetic justice was when Napoleon finally conquered Venice, he stole the horses, but the horses then found their way back. <laughs> <laughs> and they're there, and what you find is that these Olivetti and, and these people, they now send, if you want to, you know, you want to ante up like $25 million, they'll send you one horse for three months, or, Something like that. Uh, yeah, they will. They will. You can, if you want to do a, you know, an exhibition in St. Louis or something, right? If the local chamber of commerce corps up, then they'll they'll send you one horse. Or you want two horses? You know, it gets up to a hundred million very, very quickly. So by this time, by this time, it's very clear that uh, Dandolo and company, the Venetian oligarchy, have taken over the Byzantine Empire, right? And that and they they then created. This is funny because Dandolo had promised, he said, to the oligarchs of Venice, he said, if you guys play along with me, I'm going to get you all the gold. All the gold in the world. And came close, right, by, by conquering Byzantium. And uh, from this point on, Venice officially proclaimed itself to be the lord of one quarter and one half of one quarter of the Roman Empire. Because remember that the Byzantine Empire, to the very end, never called itself Byzantine Empire. It called itself Roman Empire. Right? That's what the official name of it. Indeed, you can go to Greece today. If you go to a Greek peasant and ask, what is your nationality? He'll say, I am Romeos. I am a Roman. I'm a citizen of the Roman Empire. That's what a peasant will tell you, because it's reached down to that level of the language. Now, I guess the, the interesting thing for us is to see that with this, the, uh, the Venetians had actually, they had seized control of the Mediterranean. They were now the dominant force in the entire Mediterranean. And what this then led to was within, within 150 years, an absolutely devastating 
crash. In other words, the, the, the most horrendous uh, since the Dark Ages. In other words, this, this Dark Age that began about 1300 and went on until about, oh, say, 1400, until the beginning of the, uh, of the Renaissance. And of course, what that had to do with was that they now created the Latin Empire, right? in other words, the Venetian Empire of Byzantium, and they began otherwise to wipe out any opposition in the central Mediterranean. The main opposition in the wake of this was Frederick II of Hohenstaufen. So what they did was the Venetians, given the fact that, you know, that the Byzantine court, by virtue of the fact that you can go up the Dnieper and get to the Baltic, right? You know this stuff? You go up the rivers and you have a little portage and you can, th th this Byz Byzantium is always very close to the, to the uh, Scandinavians. Byzantine emperor always had a Danish or Swedish personal guard. So uh, that's the secret of the Normans, right? The Vikings, was that they were then, they were encouraged by the Byzantines, you know, why don't you go destroy northern France, you Vikings? Why don't you go destroy England? And eventually, why don't you go and destroy Sicily, which is what they did. With these, these transplanted Vikings <coughs> from France came in and took over Sicily and kicked out... Uh, Frederick II of Hohenstaufen killed his son, killed his grandson. And with that, you have the whole central Mediterranean pitching right down into this horrible, horrible uh, decline, right? The Black Death and, you know, what, what we've called the Badi and Peruzzi. Although it's, it's, it's probably less the Badi and Peruzzi than it is these Venetian banking houses uh, themselves. So they certainly controlled the... Um, the uh, territory there in the middle of the Mediterranean for a couple of centuries. But uh, with these consequences, in other words, the, the perfect moment of dominance then turned into the, the moment of, uh, of, uh, of this crash. Now, I guess that might be a, a place to, to break off. Uh, you know, the, the, in just in line with this, though, the one last thing is if you go back to um, what I was trying to show you about Rome, when Rome had emerged as the dominant force in the world, right? 150 BC, defeated uh, Carthage, defeated Macedonia, defeated Syria, and so forth. It's exactly at that moment that it fell apart with these civil wars for 150 years. Now, if you think of the British classical studies guys, and they say, okay, the US, right? US is Rome, Soviet Union is Carthage, Carthage has been destroyed. What happens to Rome? It has to break apart into at least a century and a half of civil war. Mm -hmm. Again, it's, it's a similar, similar phenomenon. All right. So I guess with that, we've at least we've identified what's the cancer, at least to some degree, and we've begin to begun to show how the cancer then began to make its way into this uh, Venetian operation, and at least some of the characteristics of this, right? Without belaboring the things that people know. And if, uh, if we can organize it, then for next week sometime, we could probably go back and uh, sure. look into the, the further metastasis and try to pay attention to this 18th century. Because I think the stuff on the, on the, the Reformation, the Counter-Reformation, right? Luther, Calvin, Henry VIII, Contarini, the Council of Trent, we've done a lot of that. But what we haven't really done is this 18th century. Again, Casanova, Cagliostro, and uh, Ortez. Leonardo spent a short time in Venice and was playing with the idea of doing some projects, military projects for the nations and it felt cool. And I wonder if you have any idea what that may have been about. Well, I, I think it's it's important to see that um, that Leonardo was, was mainly a military advisor to the immediate enemy of Venice, right? To Lodovico il Moro, Grand Duke of Milan, right? I mean, that's what he really did. That's where he stayed. That's, that's what he was, he was devoted to. Remember, just about everybody went to Venice because it was such a big, important place. Remember that, um, in particular, Petrarca gave his library. Right? This is the famous story that the, the nucleus of the, of the Martian library, in other words, of St. Mark's library in the middle of Venice, is the library of Petrarca, which he gave. Because This is a funny story because Petrarca moved in on Venice and then there appeared these four Aristotelian friends who took him under their wing. And it turned out that they were the nucleus of the Aristotelian school of the Rialto, 
which was not a university, but it's the school where the patricians themselves taught and studied yeah. Yeah. Aristotle, right? And, uh, far into you know, their lives, not as university students only, but as full-blown patricians. They would go to the school of the Rialto to teach uh, Aristotle. So Petrarca tried to influence um, Venice. Remember that Dante's last diplomatic mission was that he was the representative of Ravenna, was sent to Venice, and they basically killed him, right? They, they, they made him, they wouldn't give him a safe conduct to go on the malaria-free road, but they said, you're going to go through the swamp, and that was the end of them. That killed him. Um, Erasmus, right? If you remember, Erasmus spent time in Venice, and this is this funny thing about the uh, Opulencia Sordida in his colloquy, where he says, I lived in the house of Aldous, the editor, and uh, the guy, he said, he's growing shellfish in the toilet. <laughs> Uh, which he's dishing up, and then we had we had ten people for dinner the other day, and uh, apparatus erat duo wova, two eggs for everybody, for the whole group, and for ten people, two eggs. So this was how stingy the, the Venetians were. So I mean, basically everybody went. Remember though that that Leonardo was fighting them, and then Machiavelli even more. Machiavelli was a participant in the War of the League of Cambrai. He was delivering money from Florence to French troops uh, along the, uh, the front there, you know, near Padova or Verona or someplace like this. The, the, the general hope of most of these people in the Italian Renaissance was that somebody could be found, and the somebody might have been Cesare Borgia, hmm, to, to try to knock off the Venetian. Because that's, if you look at where Cesare Borgia was, he was operating on the southern edge of the Venetian territory. So the, the hope was to put together a diplomatic combination that could destroy the Venetians. And uh, Machiavelli knows that. I mean, you find very good quotes from Machiavelli where he tells how much he hates Venice. And of course, Aeneas Silvius Piccolomini even more. Right? He's the most outspoken, most explicit of, the, of those who, Pius II, right? the condemning, condemning Venice. Yes? Well, just struck me from what you were talking about, but uh, maybe you could fill something in. John Ruskin and the pre Raphaelites, it sounds like it's really just Diocletian. Yeah, I, I guess. Uh, although they, you know, that, that they, this was supposedly an aesthetic movement. Uh, I, I, I'd like to show you the, uh, gosh, the, the aesthetics of Diocletian. Is, if you've ever seen these colossal heads of Constantine, there's one in the, in, uh, on the Capitoline Hill in Rome, in the Roman capital, which is this huge, I mean, it's, it's about as tall as this room. It would, it would fill this entire corner. It's a colossal marble or stone head of Constantine with these big, you know, like thyroid eyes popping out. And so, I mean, you know, Diocletian's contribution to art, right? The contribution of Diocletian and, and Constantine to art was... <laughs> But not that good. <laughs> but Rus yes, I'm sure Ruskin, I mean, the, the, they, the, this is what they like. I mean, that's, they find that congenial. The guild social. Yeah, guild. Well, the guild, and, and, and then, of course, see, we went further. These guys, you know, William Morris, for example, right, that, you know, that was explicitly based on guild. And then, and then you know, the uh, Gabriele D'Annunzio, right, the, the, the constitution for Fiume, is, it's all based on guilds. And that's what a fascist corporate state is. It was the, the Diocletian Empire was a communist, fascist, corporate state. And it's a fascinating thing. Again, that's communism. That's where it comes from. It doesn't come from any place else. Yeah, the feudalism. And it was not successful. should not be tried again. <laughs> no, need, no need to go down this road another time with Boutros, Boutros, Gali. Swedish model. <laughs> Who is she? <laughs> Any more? Well, thank you.